So today we're going to bring in a guest who I've only really recently discovered, maybe in the last, I don't know, four or five months or so. His name is Yaron Brook. He's the chairman of the board at the An the Ayn Rand Institute. I it's funny, Yaron. I always say and right. right? <laughs> I mean, you know, but it's it's I I got your name right, I think, and Ayn Rand right, right? It's yes, it, it is Yaron. Okay. Uh you know, true. Right. I'm like, I'm a huge YouTuber. Okay. I, I jump around. You might say I waste time, but I don't really consider it wasting time because sometimes you discover somebody. And uh, in this case, I discovered Yaron, who you've done so many interviews. I mean, you talk about all kinds of different things, but there is one central theme, I think, mm -hmm. and it's certainly one central person to, uh, to the things that you address. And it's the 20th century philosopher, I guess we'll call her, writer philosopher, Ayn Rand, who was a, um, a, a more or less a refugee from the Soviet Union in the, the early part of last century. Enormously influential writer, thinker, etc. And the more I hear you, Yaren, talk about her and apply her thoughts, philosophy, approach, to current events the more i wanted to talk to you and say man good every <laughs> single time but you know when i'm talking about sports this stuff just has a way of popping up and it's it's tough to describe it's it's not like i can say oh well this is ayn rand and this is sport like this is where the intersection is it's it's not as clear as that but um i just wanted to welcome you in and maybe quickly give us like a uh, 20 to 30 second I don't know, nutshell version of what Ayn Rand's approach philosophy is. Can we do that? Is that possible? We can try, uh, probably not 30 to 40 seconds, but we can try. You know, reality is what it is. Uh, it doesn't bend to your wishes. It doesn't, be, it's not determined by some other consciousness. It just is. And you have the tool to know it, your reason. You don't know the world through emotion. You don't know the world through revelation. It's the work of, of reasoning through, of identifying, integrating uh, the, the, the evidence of your senses. Only individuals can reason, uh, just like groups can't eat. Other people can't eat for you. Mm -hmm. Other people can't think for you. You're responsible for your own thinking, for your own ideas, for your own values. And your purpose in life should be your own happiness. You shouldn't live for other people. You shouldn't expect other people to live for you. You should live for yourself, interacting with other people uh, in win-win relationships, win-win uh, relationships, uh, spiritually win-win relationships, materially uh, as a trader. And then the political system that is more, most appropriate for life of a rational being pursuing his own happiness is a political system of freedom, a uh, political system of uh, where the government protects individual rights and, and that's its sole purpose and that is that is the essence of capitalism so anti-socialism anti any form of statism pro individual rights pro capitalism right so it's you know there's so many issues in sports that come up that have kind of this overarching theme i mean just as an example i'm reading this week that there's this controversy in the nfl where the players don't want to partake in these off-season um, workouts for, you know, fear of maybe catching COVID. They want to minimize that risk, right? And they're, you know, it, just I keep hearing this word pop up, solidarity. In the name of solidarity, we the teams are not going to, you know, partake in this. And it almost frames the coaches and the organizations as being tyrannical in some way. So it's, there's a lot of like us versus them. We're right, they're wrong, that kind of thing that pops up, you know, in college football or college athletics. Should we pay players? That, that you know, Or is the NCAA evil? That, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's, there's one key thing that you pointed to when you were describing that, uh, Yaron. Self-interest right? Self-interest, not living for others. I think when people hear that, they hear selfish, right? Like be selfish, push everybody else out of the way, act immorally, be Bernie Madoff, right? Type yep. thing. Whereas my understanding is the more you act in your own self-interest and pursue your own goals diligently, the better you're going to be for everybody else around you. Does that make sense? Well, maybe not everybody else, right? I'm not sure. I'm not gonna 
commit to that. But to the people that matter, sure. Um, so Ayn Rand redefines the term selfish, or she resurrects its original definition, which is really taking care of self. Taking care of self does not involve lying, cheating, stealing, and treating pe other people really, really badly. That always boomerangs back at you. It, it basically is, a, you know, a person who does that has no integrity, is, is, is dishonest, is not using his mind to pursue his own values, and, you know, is not going to be happy. Look at Bernie Madoff, landed up in jail, just died, age 82, miserable, has always been miserable, was actually more miserable when he was rich than he is in jail, because when he was rich, he was lying to everybody. He had no friends. He couldn't look his family in the eye, couldn't have any kind of relationships. So no, the idea of self-interest is the idea of how do you build the best life you can build for yourself? And that involves creating win. That involves, first of all, committing to living a good life for yourself. It means investing in it, thinking about it, devoting time to it. How many people sit down and say, how am I going to make my life the best it can be, right? I'm going to live like 80 years. I want them to be every moment. I want it to count for something. I want it to really, really mean something. And I want to have fun doing it. I want to enjoy it. I want to, I want to really be happy at the end of the day, right? How many people do that? Almost nobody does it. And in that sense, almost nobody is selfish. Almost nobody's taking care of themselves. And then with regard to other people, the way to think about that is you want to treat them with justice. People who are bad, you don't want to have anything to do with them. And sometimes you want to actually penalize them because they're bad people. You want to distance them from yourself. You don't want it to have the bad influence on you. People who are good, you want to bring closer to you. And you want to trade with people. You want to create these win-win relationships, as many win-win relationships as possible. Now, it's interesting because we're talking sports, right? And in sports, it's win-lose. But yeah. there's a sense in which, for example, accepting the rules of the game, living up to the rules of the game, having integrity around the rules of the game is win-win, right? Even if you lose a game because you stuck to the rules, because you're, you're, you're sustaining a game that is important to your livelihood, is important to your happiness, is important to your values. So you don't cheat to win, even though winning is important, because more fundamental than that is your integrity, and more fundamental than that is the value the game provides your life. Right. So I, just as an example of that, I think, think of steroids in baseball, right? It was the big, you know, late 90s, mid 2000s. Oh, we're all watching baseball, McGuire, everything. And it seemed like it was great. And then all of a sudden we found out all these guys were doing it. And then the game, not that it ruined the game, but it kind of, it's never gotten back to where it was. Therefore, kind of like you're saying there, cheating the game did not do the game any good long term it, it did you know i think that's right and I mean, there's a whole discussion to be had about whether the game should exclude steroids or not mm -hmm. or what the rules should be once the rules are set cheating on those rules is a is undermining of the game itself and therefore undermining of your uh, these people care about the hall of fame they care about their, their place in history they care about records they care about being winners as individuals and it undermines it it put puts what they call an asterisk next to their name. And, and so was it worth it? For, for many of them, it wasn't. And for the game, it wasn't. So how do we define integrity? Or I guess how would Rand define integrity in that kind of context? Because you say, you know, good, bad. I mean, objectivism, good, bad, you know, it's not in here. It exists out there. How do we... No, no, objectivism is not in here, but it exists. Everything... Everything to be objective is, in a sense, an interaction between what's out there and your evaluation of it. Good and bad are human assignments, right? They don't exist out there mm. independent of human consciousness, right? Good or bad for whom? In what context? When? Is, is killing somebody good or bad? Well, almost everybody would say bad. If it's in self-defense, oh, then it might be good, right? So it, the context matters. So it always matters... In what context is a particular action happening? Integrity means sticking to your moral values, those moral values that are pro your life, right? So sticking to pro-life moral values, that's integrity. And to the extent that honesty is a crucial, I think, pro-life moral value, that lying undermines you, undermines your life, undermines your integrity, 
undermines your future. Um, lying is 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 goes against integrity. It, it it's it, if you lie, you're undermining your own values, your own life. I mean, look at uh, to bring it back to sports. Look at uh, with a cyclist. Remind me his name. Oh, uh, Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. He lied, he lied, he lied, he lied, he lied. When he was caught finally, and you're always caught. On big lies, you're always caught. I mean, he's miserable now. He's lost everything. He, he They've taken away all his Tour de France winnings. He's going to be viewed as a, as a bad guy in history, a bad guy in sports. He's a nobody. And 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 he, from a self-esteem perspective, he's, he's, he's being crushed. Was it worth a lie? Of course not. Even though he got those highs. It's like taking drugs. I mean, you might get the high when you take the drug. Is it worth it? You know, almost never, right? right. It's always not worth it. Do you think that, and this is a, this is a, about as large a question as you could possibly ask about sports, but you know, from the, from a young age, when it, when a child first gets interested in sports, and let's say that they have, you know, just a great proclivity, they're, they've got their physical potential, et cetera. And, you know, maybe the parents recognize, okay, I think sports are, are for my son or my daughter. Do you think that the lessons that a kid is going to learn along the way teach that kid or our our kids <sighs> integrity or do you think that it, it depends yeah. it, it really depends on the coaches it depends mm -hmm. on the parents i mean so many parents are uh, win at all costs even at the cost of your own integrity don't think long term it's just a matter of winning right now they can learn a very wrong lesson same with coaches there's some bad coaches out there who 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 instill the wrong kind of values and the wrong kind of sense of integrity. I think sports, like any, anything that a child does that it devotes huge amount of energy to, huge amount of focus to, and achieves real achievements in, you know, kids can learn a lot from that experience and can learn real values from it if it's coached in the right perspective. But it can also be, it can also teach them the, the wrong things if the coaches and the parents are, in a sense, bad people and, and are teaching bad things. I just want to uh, recommend a couple of things here real quick. Uh, Ayn Rand, I mean, she's she's an author. And, and evidently when she moved as a, ch did she move as a child from the Soviet Union or was she adult? No, she was in her 20s. She was, she was in her 20s, young, okay. Yeah. Because she, she went to Hollywood, right? Because she wanted to become a, uh, a scriptwriter for yep. for films, right? Uh, but she ended up, well, obviously authoring her own stuff. And just two books, if you're interested uh, in some of her work. Would you recommend Atlas Shrugged and or The Fountainhead? I would recommend both. I would recommend starting with The Fountainhead for most people and then reading Atlas Shrugged. If you're really into politics and yeah. politics the world then i would start with atlas shrugged but i'd say for most people start with the fountainhead okay and the and these by the way are uh they're, they're stories it's not you know sometimes you pick up a book by you know nietzsche or kant or something no, no, it's no, just, these it's are just novels. straight up yeah these are novels they're exactly stories, right the fun reads i think the fountainhead is the american novel i think it's the most important you know it's a it's a classic american novel everybody should read the fountainhead uh you know it was made into a movie gary cooper uh, patricia neal o'neill uh, we're in it, but I would recommend reading the book before you see the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, no, absolutely. These are thrilling, exciting, interesting stories. Even if you land up not agreeing with a philosophy, you know, I know a lot of people violently agree with Ayn Rand's philosophy. Disagree, sorry, disagree with Ayn Rand's philosophy. We love the fountain, <laughs> right? Love the novel because of the heroes in it, because of the, the characters in it. Um, and I think for sports fans, I think Ayn Rand has a, has a unique appeal, not because she deals with sports, but there's something about sports that's unique. It, it's one of the last refuge, refuge in, our, in our world where there are winners and losers. In a sense, not really, but in a sense, they're good guys and bad guys, right? They're your guys and, sure. right, and, you're, 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 and uh, you know, success is rewarded and, and failure is, is not. Uh, not everybody gets a ribbon, right? Uh, in, in, at least in professional Theoretically, sports. Theoretically, yeah. <laughs> right to country, in professional sports, you do not all get a ribbon. So uh, Ayn Rand's world is very much that kind of world. It, it's a world of good guys and bad guys. It's a world of heroes. 
it's a world of of people who you know people who step at the plate ninth inning you know two out uh and and hit home runs to win the game that that's the kind of world she has those are the kind of heroes she portrays you know what's interesting about that is that you know, up here in Washington, we have Gonzaga, right? The team that just lost in the uh, the NCAA men's basketball tournament in the final. Now, they're a team they went undefeated the whole year right up until that last game. And we're beaten pretty soundly by, by a good Baylor team. And, you know, it's, it's funny, Aaron. I'm on Twitter a lot, okay? I don't know how much time you spend there. But I see a lot of reaction to certain things and you can almost see patterns at times and one thing that i saw with gonzaga or from gonzaga fans was well you can't criticize gonzaga for that loss because they had a great season i feel like more and more i hear people even though your team lost or did something wrong or this or that try to spin it like uh, yeah we lost but it's not so bad because of blah 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 blah, blah. it's almost like they're they're not willing to accept the loss for what it is and I, for i see that as problematic does how would you interpret that it's probably always been that case i mean people don't want to completely face the fact that the lost i mean what did the red Sox invent a curse you yeah. know to explain the fact that for you know 80 years 90 years or whatever they, they couldn't win a world series so people try to try to find excuses try to find justification for the fact that they've lost um but yeah, I think in 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 our modern day, uh, which is dominated by kind of an egalitarian philosophy and egalitarian view of the world, uh, we, we, there, there's much, there's more and more. Uh, don't emphasize the winners. Yeah, you know, everybody's equal. Everybody's the same. Everybody gets a ribbon. I think it's interesting because if Gonzaga had won, they would have celebrated like like crazy, right? The win. Um, but it's it's when you lose, you bring out that more egalitarian perspective, right? Uh, in, in an effort to kind of, kind of ease the pain of actually having having lost. So that pain of having lost, though, isn't there value in that? You mentioned the Red Sox, right? I mean, for the first 25 years of my life, I was a Red Sox fan who gradually started believing in curses as it went, like 86 and then, you know, 99, 2003, like the whole thing. And then the whole history of it, like you get indoctrinated into that yep. when you're when you're from New England. But, and you can say the same thing for Cub fans, I guess. The pain that you experience has value because it it adds to the joy, or it actually it creates the joy in some way that you experience when you finally win. So isn't so is minimizing pain a good thing? Well, remember. This is a, a, a fun part of life, an important, you know, an important part of life, sports is. Mm. It's not crucial, though, right? It's not real pain. Not, not, and it shouldn't be, right? If it is, <laughs> you know, you, you, should, you, should, you should check your consult life. Consult a right? therapist. Yeah, yeah <laughs> consult a therapist. This is a, it's a game. And, and, and uh, uh, to some extent, we're fans of a particular team for random reasons, right? Because we were born in a particular area, because we lived in a particular time of our lives at a particular place. I became a Red Sox fan because I happened to live between the ages of 14 and 16, happened to live in Boston. And, and those are uh, uh, periods in which you, you, you know, there's a big influence. All the music uh, that I, you know, popular music I love is from that period of time, right? This, what what this period was, of time is that, by the way? This would be the, the, the mid seventies. This would be Carlton Fisk's. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. Game winning, uh, you know, it, it right. six, the World Series against Cincinnati Reds. And then Bucky um, Dent a few years later, the pain of that, right? Yeah, I wasn't there with Bucky Dent. Okay. So I wasn't in Boston when that happened. But but that was, uh, you know, Carlton Fisk was 75. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Fred Lynn, uh, uh, you know, was in the outfield. Jim Rice, uh, I think Carl Yastrzemski was still He was there, court. yeah. Evans, yeah. yeah. So, so it was a great team of, of really legends. And I can still remember, I don't remember anything else. But when I was, you know, when I was 14, but I remember the almost the entire lineup of the Boston Red Sox from that season, which is insane, right? <laughs> so these things, these things kind of stick with you in a way. But on the other hand, it's not, it, it's not existentially a threat to me if the Red Sox lose. And as a consequence, the pain should only go so far down. It's not like a loved one dying. It's not, it's not like something really horrific happening in your life. So, you know, and fans where it becomes that, 
you know, it is, I think it is, it does become a problem. It, 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 it starts to dominate their life and obsess their life and they can't pursue other values, which is a real threat to their happiness. That's true. Now, having worked in sports talk radio for 15 years, okay, what I've found is that people, people take sports conversations and they use those as fronts to fight other battles, like moral yep. battles. Like, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard in the owner versus player, like union versus owners uh, debates when, when labor issues come up. I can't sure. tell you how many times I've heard people say, I always side with millionaire players over billionaire owners. I've heard that so many times. Like people make up their mind ahead of time as to who they're going to side with, regardless of the issue, just based on the fact that, what, one side has earned more or whatever. Sure, I mean, it's, it's, it's if you brought up with the certain Marxist philosophy, right? Then yeah. you always decide with the workers versus the owners. Uh, you know, wh whoever makes more money is more evil. That, that That's just part of the philosophy. Uh, uh, in capitalist America, um, you, many people are raised with the opposite attitude. You're, you know, instead of citing on the issue, right? And, and figuring out what you really think about the particular issue, they have preconceived notions based on their kind of philosophies and based on, on how they were raised and, and their perspective on the world. Why is that? I mean, I have my own ideas about this, but why is that unhealthy or wrong? Well, you know, it's always unhealthy not to look at the facts and not to look at the actual evidence and to, you know, uh, compress everything into kind of a, a set format that you already have. Um, let's say I, you know, I love capitalists. I, I love people who billionaires. I love billionaires. I think they're great. They, <laughs> they create a lot of value for me. You know, I think they're, I think they're wonderful human beings, right? That goes against the grain. I know, but you know, some billionaires are scumbags, right? They just are. So I, I don't say all billionaires are good guys. Cause I, cause I, I, I appreciate what it takes to become a billionaire. And, and I admire that in people. I want to value it each. If I, if, if it comes to that, it's an issue of justice. I want to value it. And, and just because I think, I don't know, some billionaire is basically a good guy because they've been productive and they've produced and they've created and they've traded and they've made the world a better place, I think. Uh, that doesn't mean every decision they make is the right decision. Right. Doesn't mean every decision I make. I mean, they're not gods. Nobody's a god. And the same is true in terms of workers. Some, some uh, you know, sometimes workers are... Uh, um, a right in their complaints against uh, employers, and sometimes they're wrong. So uh, you've got to be able to look at issue by issue, evaluate the facts, evaluate the conditions, the context again, and 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 figure out who's right and who's wrong. Why do you think that? I mean, I first of all, I totally agree with you. I mean, if you are debating something, anything, in order to communicate. We at least need to be able to agree on the facts. Otherwise, any conversation thereafter, I think, is a non-starter. But why do you think people tend to decide ahead of time who they're going to side with before they even know what the issue is? Like, why is why is there a tendency in humans to even do that? <laughs> because they don't want to think for themselves. Because being tribal associating I mean, you see this in politics all the time so it doesn't surprise me that it's 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 filtered it filters into sports and in, into every aspect of life um reason thinking is work it requires effort and one has to be convinced it's worthwhile and we live in a culture that doesn't view thinking as as that worthwhile yeah you have to do it sometimes but um, and, and a lot of, we're taught, we teach, our, we teach kids, you know, who are you to have an opinion about that? A, an opinion. I mean, we respect their feelings, their emotions. We're very good at that. Mm -hmm. We don't respect their minds. We don't emphasize the mind. We don't teach critical thinking in our schools. We don't emphasize the, the, just the, the work and the effort and the importance of being rational, right? That's not a value almost in anybody out there. Right. Unless you go, unless it's work at work, you have to be, yeah, you have to be a facts and stuff, but outside of work in our lives, we don't value rationality. Now, if, if we don't value rationality, if, if we're taught that our minds, you know, everybody has his own point of view, it's all subjective. Nobody knows the truth, all of that garbage. Then how do I trust 
what I think. So maybe I shouldn't go through the effort. Maybe it's not worth it. Maybe I should just listen to Joe or listen to, you know, my little tribe or my friends. Or, you know, if I'm a Republican, I listen to Republicans. If I'm a Democrat, I listen to Republic Democrats. If I'm a sports fan of this inclination, it's just easier than to always. It, it's a shortcut, right? Uh, what does Joe think? Or what do workers want? Or I hate the owners. Or I hate, just simple rules make life easier but they also screw you up. So beware of them, right? You, you, you want to always do the thinking. I think that there's a safety in yep. that, right? It, when, when you can. A laziness and safety. Yeah. Right? Because Lazy. You, when you want to, when you tend to identify with somebody else, when you identify that guy and you say, oh, he's like me, or he thinks like me. Yep. And then you say, he, what part of, what group is he in? Oh, he's that one. Therefore. So now you don't feel like you're alone. Do you think yep. that there's an element of, um, I guess, objectivism or even cri just critical thinking itself, which makes, which may make one feel alone? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, but but we are alone. So I mean, it's it's good for us to feel alone, right? Right. At the end of the day, you're born alone, you die alone. I mean, you you could you could talk about family all all you want, but at the end of the day, only you can feel what you feel, only you can think what you think you are in, in some fundamental metaphysical sense alone. And then you choose to interact. But, but that means, what that means is not, you shouldn't fear being alone. You shouldn't feel lonely. What, what, it, what it should really mean, the sense that only you can think for yourself, only you can have values for you, only you can feel, is the importance of doing it. That is the importance of embracing you as an individual, embracing your choices, your values, your thinking, and investing in it. Look, I, I say this often, and it's a cliche, but it's a true cliche. You only live once. Every second that you live, you'll never get back. Life is amazing. It's fun. It's, it's, it's exciting, or it can be, right? Mm. And what a waste if you waste your time doing something you hate or, <laughs> or, or just following stupid people or, or, or getting engaged in, in kind of a tribal mentality where what you believe is not yours. It's not, you're not committed to it. It's not consistent with your values. You, you know, it's, life's too short to be miserable, right? Life's too short. And you're going to be miserable sometimes. Look, bad stuff happens. Uh, so, but but don't bring it upon yourself. Don't think do things that that bring misery to you. And I think the tribalist mentality is a miserable mentality yeah. because you don't own anything. You don't own your values. You don't own your thoughts. Right. You just tend to follow. I mean, follow. Yeah. I mean, chasing. <laughs> chasing the ghosts of misery where they are not right identifying oh that's you know this guy's doing that and this when when, when he's not right i i just think let's let's and take yeah good and and that's about also having a, a healthy attitude towards sports yeah you're going to be bummed when your team loses mm. but it can't be the end of the world i mean it, that's it can be your life right so and and i know too many sports fans who are obsessed this is it and and it's not you know, and we like, well, you didn't play, right? I mean, there's a sense, I, I love fans. Fandom is a value, I think. Embracing that mentality and really cheering for your team and really getting exciting and having ups and downs with the team. As long as it is healthy in a sense that it is not, you know, uh, uh, causing you to be miserable in your life, right? Right. I think, so. you know, more and more, maybe young people are choosing who they root for in sports because of the player and less yep. having to do with the team, right? Because, you know, when you were growing up or maybe even when I was growing up, like, like 80s, 90s, you saw the team that was around you, right? That was broadcast. And now you can just see anybody you want. And I feel like more be, because now athletes are they have an opportunity a platform to be more vocal about the things that they believe I'm sure that's a bad thing i think my yeah. guess is it probably started in the 90s with michael jordan right mm -hmm. who wasn't a michael jordan fan and therefore people all over the world literally all over the world became chicago right they became chicago fans mm -hmm. um because of michael jordan he he was the first i mean bird and 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 um and and magic were celebrities but he was the first 
global celebrity, certainly in basketball and of course baseball and football. In, no, in, in team know. sports, because you have would have had Ali before that, but you're right. Yeah, in, in, in team sports, sports yeah. In team sports. And and global, right? And so I I, can, I see that and I understand. I, for example, I don't have a team in football, but if the and and you know I'm 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 a little troubled by football generally these days, but um in the past, I've loved teams that had great quarterbacks because, I, you know, I love that position. I love what it means. I love the leadership. I love kind of the, the great quarterbacks, the thinking quarterbacks, they're smart, and, and you can see that in the way they play. So, I, you know, Joe Montana was the first guy mm -hmm. who I really loved as a quarterback because he, he didn't have the physical abilities of a great quarterback, but he had the brains above and beyond, right? And he had the... The, the the emotion right he had the ability to control himself and to and to rise to the challenge at the right moment um so i i am not surprised that people gravitate as we become globalized as we can follow any team towards particular players and i don't think that's a bad thing necessarily what if they do it though because they have an agenda okay and i'm actually gonna i'm gonna roll the clock back about five years the Super Bowl in J or in February of 2016 was Denver against Carolina. Okay. And leading up to that Super Bowl, there was a lot of Cam Newton's going to win this. And if he wins, it's going to mean it's going to be a victory for our group, meaning, you know, race or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I didn't agree with that, but it, let's just say you think that. Okay. And then when he lost the game, immediately in the press conference right after the game, I don't know if you remember this, he sat there and he sulked and he pouted and he really didn't answer any questions. And then he just, you know, stormed off. And that, as I saw, it really ended up letting down a lot of people that were kind of behind him because of what they thought he represented. And well, I think yeah, go ahead. it's a mistake. It's a mistake to to use sports as a as a as an avenue for politics mm -hmm. and, and, and and for larger social agendas. Sports is sports. Enjoy it for what it is, and don't attribute and and look. Part of why we like certain uh, athletes, I think, part of Jordan's appeal, part of Bird's appeal, and Magic's appeal, and and I think and I think Montana's appeal is how they handle themselves, right? And, and that's important. So put aside the politics, put aside everything else. Uh, they, you know, they knew how to lose. They didn't lose very often, but when they lost, they lost. They they didn't pout. They didn't complain. They, you know, and 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 players that do, you know, have a different legacy than than. But I think it's really dangerous to lump sports into politics and make sports about politics, which we're seeing now everywhere, right? Now every it's day day. yeah black lives matter you know during the orlando thing uh in the in the in the in basketball the taking a knee thing and you know my attitude is if a, a particular athlete wants to express a political statement great you know fine uh owners have to decide how they want to deal with that and that's their decision uh you might not want to have a athlete on your side who has particular political views i don't think that's i'm all for discriminating against people with particular political views and it could go either way Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it, it, but it shouldn't be a national issue. It shouldn't be the president of the United States shouldn't be commenting on it. You know, it's, it's sports and, and these athletes, you know, it's like the whole celebrity culture we live in today. Who cares what, um, uh, I don't know. I'm just going to pick up somebody. Kanye West thinks about anything. Mm -hmm. right? He's a rapper. Who cares about, who cares what, what, um, uh, Harrison Ford mm -hmm. thinks about anything. Or Clint Eastwood, for that matter, right? They're actors. They, you know, I want them to be on screen, do their job, and go home. And if they want to make comments about politics, they certainly have a right to have free speech. But I don't, I, you know, are they particularly intelligent when it comes to politics? Do they know more than the average Joe about politics? In 99% of the cases, no. So let's stop taking them seriously. When LeBron James comments on politics, I think the attitude should be, all right, so it's LeBron James. Who cares, right? It, it, but it, but it's but unfortunately it's not. They're taken as experts. They're taken as somebody we we should pay attention to and follow. Right, right. And whether we whether we think they're experts or not, I think maybe people who are my age and young, you know, maybe every maybe it's not even an age thing. I think that people have a really difficult time separating the two. Right, separating the fact that 
um, that LeBron James is an athlete from what he says, or Colin Kaepernick for that matter. I mean, the guy was kneeling on the cover of Time Magazine. Like, people are not really willing to look at what people say and just put that aside. It's if you say, yeah, go ahead. He's kneeling on the cover of Time Magazine because Time Magazine chose to make a big issue out of the fact that a sports figure was kneeling. Mm -hmm. If we had a healthier attitude towards sports figures, maybe it wouldn't have made Time Magazine. Um, you know, and, and my view of LeBron James's political views is he's wrong, but okay, lots of people are wrong. Like, uh, I think 95% of Americans are wrong on almost every issue in politics. Almost every issue. I disagree with 90, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I think they're all a pox on both their houses because I think they're all wrong. Mm -hmm. So, but that doesn't mean I don't trade with them. It doesn't mean I don't appreciate when they do good work. I mean, most of Silicon Valley, I disagree with politically. Do I stop using my iPhone because of that? Do I, <laughs> you know, it, Silicon Valley takes a knee tomorrow. Do I throw my iPhone into the trash and, and pick up what? Samsung? What, do I know what Samsung's exactly user? It's absurd. And why? I mean, yeah, if they were, if they were, you know, really horrific, right? If they were communists or Nazis, then I'd stop dealing with them. But main, most of these political views are within the mainstream. LeBron James doesn't say anything that about 40% of Americans don't agree with. Does that mean I'm not going to deal with those 40% of Americans? No, it's not. So we need on both sides to take a step back, breathe a little bit. And, you know, you have your political views. I have mine. The way to the, the way to engage with them is to debate. It's to use reason. And it's not to get all huffy and puffy because some basketball player said something. He's a basketball player. Why, why would you expect a basketball player to know better than 40% of Americans? Right. I mean, it, it's one thing when, a, when an athlete or a coach or whoever just, you know, off the cuff says something or, or tweets one thing. I do think it's a little bit different when – I mean, when you say the name Colin Kaepernick to anybody who knows who he is, you're going to think one thing first. You're not going to think of him really as an athlete. You're going to think of him as the guy who kneels. That's what, that's what he's uh, known for. But you, know, you mentioned <laughs> uh, communism, Nazism. One thing that I thought was interesting about the Kaepernick thing was, you know, he, he knelt be uh, ostensibly because he was against oppression, but he thinks he thinks there's systemic racism. Right, he, he does. But, yeah, but, but so do so do a lot of people. Sure, right? but when he They're did wrong. it, when he did it, or when he explained himself at one point, he was wearing a T-shirt that actually had Castro's face on it, and I was thinking to myself, like, you know, a why does nobody comment on that, and b why does communism not ha not get the same rap that Nazism does? Like, why is one looked at as maybe is like being fair and humane and the other is looked at as what it should be, which is reprehensible when, huge, when they're basically the same thing. That's a huge question. They, they are basically the same thing. And, and it's the reason for that is that communism is viewed as being basically based on a moral idea, an ethical idea that is true, that, that suffering is a claim is a moral claim against those who, who are not suffering, uh, that, that need is a claim. We, we don't believe to take everything from those with ability and give it to those with need. But what is the whole welfare state that Republicans and Democrats all agree on? If not, taking from some to give to others based on what? Based on need and nothing else. I would say, and, and I know this will piss off many of your views, I, <laughs> communism is basically secularization of Christianity. It's not out of the mainstream. It's indeed an embracing of the mainstream morally. Mm -hmm. Molly. And then taking it to full all the way, taking it all the way in terms of the meek shall inherit earth. Great. Let's give everything to the meek and, and treat everybody else, you know, as, as basically the slaves, which is what communism does. It's so people often say, even, even conservatives often say, communism is a great idea. It's just bad in practice. And my view is no, no, no. <laughs> communism is evil as an idea evil in practice and that's what happens evil ideas lead to evil practices evil practices are based on evil ideas the two are connected you have to reject communism ideologically you have to reject the morality of communism see nazis it's nazism is easy to reject uh, you know not just because they killed a lot of people because the communists killed even more people than the nazis 
because because it's based on race and we've internalized this idea you know a true idea that race is abhorrent but so is the so is um treating everybody the same so is stealing and taking stuff from redistribution of wealth which is basically legalized stealing so are all these things which communism is based on and indeed communism is is responsible for the death of more people than than fascism and nazism uh, so these are moral ideas that need to be challenged and yes i see it all the time communists are treated with kick gloves right i don't treat them that way i treat them as the as the murderous villains that they really are and and kaepernick should have been criticized for wearing that shirt taking a knee okay we could disagree about that one but but having a, a fidel castro shirt when you know what fidel castro did to his people the number of people he murdered and the fact that he has enslaved the Cuban people now for what 50 years they've been under the boot of communism and and have been been institutionalized into poverty and that's how horrific right? right which is why when I hear an athlete commenting on something that you know has happened whether it's a, a police involved shooting or or a law the voting law in Georgia right I mean they just moved the the, the major league baseball all-star game out of Georgia to yep. I forget where they moved it um because of that voting law it's like yeah, God, that, I, mean, I mean like the second you start you start managing your business in accordance or as a reaction to something like that which you may or may not even understand I mean prove to me first that you even understand the issue I mean clearly Kaepernick does not understand the issue that he's <laughs> protesting if you're gonna if you're gonna make a statement you need to you need to me to prove that you have a grasp and command over the topic first but, before but I'm you, gonna take you seriously but are you willing that's true but are you willing to hold everybody to that standard that's yes. the question not just the athletes oh not sure just yeah well then yeah absolutely and indeed the real question to ask here is how come everything has become politicized how come everything now is about politics everything is now about politics from education to sports teams to to, to where we're going to have the this the, the all-star game every aspect of our life has now become a political issue that to me is the real question and the real issue and i think the answer to that is the growth of government government is so powerful today it's involved in everything it's involved in every aspect of our lives. And as a consequence, we need to care about politics because they're everywhere. These politicians are, the only way to deal with that is not to go after MLB or Coca-Cola or whoever. It's to get politicians off our backs. See, Coca-Cola is saying, look, Democrats have the House, the Senate and the presidency. If I oppose what they want me to do, they could regulate me. They could they could do all create all these problems for me. What I need the headache for? Republicans, you know, have screwed it up. They're probably out of power for a while. I can afford to piss them off a little bit. <laughs> Let me side with the Democrats, right? So so they side with Democrats not necessarily because they believe it, but because they do the power calculation and they figure this is the best bet right now. Imagine if politicians didn't have any power over business. Imagine if politicians weren't involved in regulating our lives, regulating our businesses, then what power would they have over MLB? Or what power, imagine if we did away with antitrust laws, they just didn't exist. And, and the politicians couldn't threaten the MLB with yanking the antitrust exemption. Then you know, you wouldn't have politics in, in sports. Or you know, else. I don't I don't know if I disagree with that so much as I think that there's another element to it which is that an organization like Major League Baseball, for example, is more concerned with its own image and the backlash they may get if they say were to keep the All-Star game in Georgia. So it's kind of, it's like a, it's a cover my ass thing as a result of politics having run amok and being used by a certain group for, let's, let's say, what, say for what it is, being used for power. Right, I I'm mean, the I'm the victim. You're the oppressor, so you better satisfy my needs at every turn. If you do, if you don't, I'm going to call you out, and you're going to look like an asshole. Uh, absolutely, and, and and but that is a consequence of of giving government the amount of power that it does that it has. The government fuels that, 
and then, and then having and having everything politicized so mm -hmm. that it plays into that. But it's also a consequence of the fact that we have an elite, an intellectual elite primarily, that's of one voice and and of one attitude. And so so it's rare that companies leave a state because um, because Democrats have done something crazy. No, I, I'll take that back. That's absolutely not rare. That's often the case. Look at California, right? Why is Arico leaving California? Because the Democrats have gone nuts in California and they're doing stuff that hurts Arico. Uh, it hurts all businesses, they're leaving. So people leave states all the time because of the politics. Um, it's usually on the right, you know, companies leave because the economic conditions become harmful. But you know, Arico would survive even if they stayed in California. It's a statement. Why did Elon Musk build his factory in Texas versus in California? It's a it's a political statement to some extent. Mm -hmm. And we celebrate that because it's a political statement we like. But if the other side commits a political statement, like moving MLB to a different place, we don't like it. So again, I, I think there's more tribalism than anything in this. I don't really care whether MLB wants to play its baseball game. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and I don't really care where Elon Musk wants to build his Teslas. What I care about is the fact, two things. One is that everything's politicized. I think that's horrible. And second, uh, that the intellectual elites tend to be of one voice. But in terms of companies making decisions about these things, as long as they're not communists or, or, or fascists, you know, let them make decisions. We're going to disagree. They're right. Just, just all. I mean, I don't care where they play. I was the a shareholder. I would be pissed off, right? Sure. That sure. I'm maximizing my, my wealth because that should be the only concern right and i don't i don't care where they play the all-star game i don't even i maybe i'm i need to think about this but like say the there's the um the the national anthem before any sporting event right mark cuban tried to do away with the national anthem at his home stadium and the yep. nba i think he they may still be figuring that out i'm not sure but when your solution <clears throat> is to do away with something as a solution, right? Okay, well, the anthem's controversial, just do away with it. Uh, okay, well, you know, Georgia has this voting law controversy, just do away, just keep, you know, keep it out of there. Do away with this, do away with that. When you're, when we do the away with things, I, I mean, just feel like- just probably good that we do away with. Some so things, some what things. the thing is, I'd say, sure. I mean, a lot of us can be upset about it, a lot of us can be unhappy about it. We shouldn't make it illegal uh, because it's their property. They, if they don't want to play the national anthem, they don't have to. But we should be willing as fans to say, you know what? If you're not going to play the national anthem, we're not coming. Mm -hmm. You can have an empty stadium. Make them pay for it economically. You see, that to me is the way we deal with one another. We deal with, if I don't like what you're doing, I don't have to deal with you. I can turn around and go somewhere else. If I don't like how you're managing the baseball team that I'm a fan of, I can stop coming to games, stop supporting you financially. If I don't like uh, that you're not playing the national anthem, I just don't go to games anymore. And if enough people do that, you'll change your mind, right? So use the economic power that you have as a fan to influence. And, and maybe that's a place where you rally other people, mm -hmm. you get it together, you say we're boycotting games. I think that's great when that happens. And I think it's great when that happens, even if it's, it goes against what I think. Right, because I think that's the right way to behave versus we're going to get politicians to put pressure on you to force you to do this or, or we're going to pass a law or we're going to get the president of the United States to say, you know, you can't do this or whatever. No, the, the, keep politics out of it. As owners, fans, athletes, let's, through the volunteer exchange relationships that we all have, did Colin, did Colin Kaepernick break his contract by kneeling? Maybe, I don't know. Fire him. Just fire him. You broke up contracts, contract law, right? Just abide by the contract. And if he didn't, maybe in future contracts, you should have, if you want to play on my team, you have to stand for the national anthem. Or not. Whatever you want to write into the contract. Mm -hmm. And then we as sports fans will decide, do we want to go to your will game? Will we support or it or not? Yeah. And, and, and make it voluntary. So that, that's my view. If people don't like the decision MLB made, don't go to the All-Star game and, and, and make a statement that way. And, or, or stop watching baseball. Don't go to any games mm -hmm. until, they, until they change the politicization. But to, to make it more political, 
by by I don't know uh, Ted Cruz and and uh, and Lee and and uh, uh, Josh Hawley wanting to pass a law that penalizes MLB. Now you've opened up unbelievable can of worms where every time a business does something that I politically don't like, I run to my congressman, they pass a law to fix it. I mean, that's nuts. Right. And that denies the business the right, the property right, to make choices that people don't like. And the way to deal with those choices is to boycott them if you don't like the choices. Yeah, and I feel like we're just getting warmed up 52 minutes into this. I could talk to you for another four hours, which I'm sure you wouldn't want to do. <laughs> but this, I mean, really. Happy to do it. No, I, I love talking about this stuff. And I love, actually love sports. I think sports are amazing. And it's a, it's a topic I don't talk about very often. So it's fun. It's fun to have a context and an audience to talk about sports that, that appreciate it. So, no, we should we should do this again. I mean, yeah. That, it would absolutely be fun. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would love to talk to you maybe even just in a few weeks to do this because really, yeah. I mean, we're, yeah. we, kind, we kind of in a surfacey sort of way kind of bounced around. But the more I hear you speak, the more questions it raises. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. Real quick before I let you go, though, you are kind of everywhere. But can you tell people where the best places are to find your work? You know, you're on bookshow.com is a website that has a lot of the material. You know, I've got a book. That one equal is unfair, which is you know, in, in, in sports equal is unfair, right? Mm. We all know this. I I'd like us to stop believing that in life, that's true. The, the only place equality means anything is political equality. We should all be treated the same by the law. We all have the same rights. We're all equal in that sense, but in every other respect in life, we're not equal. Stop pretending. Um, and sports, the thing the, one of the things I really love about sports is we don't pretend LeBron James is better than pretty much everybody else in basketball. That's just a fact. Right. And uh, whether he's the greatest of all time or not, that's irrelevant. But right now, or, or at least five years ago, suddenly he was the greatest player in the world. And nobody apologized for that. Nobody, nobody said, oh, no, we have to treat everybody the same. No, he made more money and we cheered. And, and you know, how about applying that to business and to, and to other things as well? And then, of course, I have a podcast. You can find me on YouTube. Just put my name into YouTube and put my name in Google. You'll find everything you need. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. But but YouTube and, and my website, those are the two places you can find me. That's the – God, that's the thing about I, – I, when I hear an athlete tending towards, like, the left and socialism, I think to myself, like, you're an athlete. Like, the better you are, the more money you're going to make. That's a system you don't support? Like, what are you, nuts? Like, it doesn't make any sense. They don't think it through. But look. Right. Most athletes – have single-mindedly devoted their life to their, to their, if it's basketball, baseball, whatever mm. it is, to, to their sport. I don't expect them to know anything about the world beyond that, particularly if you think about from age, I don't know, 10, 12, 8, 6, they've devoted, they're, they're not exactly, they're smart. There's, many of them are super smart. They couldn't be great athletes if they weren't smart. But they're smart in a particular way. They've studied a particular thing. It's not expansive. So I'm not surprised by their ignorance and by the fact that they're wrong on political issues or, or that they don't think these things through. They don't have the life experience to do it. Most of them are young, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many stupid things did I say when I was in my 20s? Exactly. I didn't have a big microphone in front of me, and the world didn't care. And we <laughs> shouldn't care. I mean, this is the thing I, it, it, to, to, to the fans. Why do you care what an athlete says? It's meaningless. It's like... Joe Schmo on the street saying something. Nobody cares. Nobody should care. The whole celebrity culture where we give celebrities this out, otherworldly importance, particularly when it comes to politics and, and philosophy and, and way of living is absurd and ridiculous. So, so it's on us to stop caring. If we stop caring, the media will stop caring and these athletes will stop, will stop uh, 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 talking nonsense. I blame <laughs> the state of the world. I blame intellectuals, people who should know better, people who've studied, people who do the equivalent of a of an athlete, equivalent of a great basketball player in intellectual field. When they're wrong, and they all are, almost all the time, that's horrific, right? That is truly, truly horrific. So, uh, my villains are not LeBron James. My villains in 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 politics and intellectual pursuits. My villains are. Paul Krugman, right? Mm. That's a villain, right? LeBron James, eh, who cares? <laughs> Great well, basketball player. I'll enjoy him doing that. I don't really care what he thinks about politics. It's meaningless to my life. Well said, sir. Uh, take care. This has been just absolutely wonderful. Hope to talk to you again soon.
absolutely. Talk to Angela and we'll, we'll schedule, we'll schedule this for a few weeks. Okay.